All right, Chris Blair is the voice of the LSU Tigers entering his sixth football season. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, man, it's good to see you. Good to see you, man. Where's the fine line in the impromptu emotion and kind of maybe scripting a little something in your head to deliver? You know, I get asked that a lot, and, and the truth of the matter is, even if I sat down before the game or a week before the game and said, you know what, we're playing this team, and if we win, it means this, you know, this would be a nice little soliloquy that I could write up. That, that with the emotion and all the things that are going on around me uh, with our crew and just the things that we do, there's no way I would I would butcher it because I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to recall it. There's too much movement. mechanical. Yeah, absolutely. What I do try to do is understand what this moment will mean. You know what a loss would mean, what a win would mean. Hopefully, you've got enough wherewithal in those moments to be able to pull those nuggets from the recesses of your brain and and relay that somehow. But you know, at the end of the day, when when Joe Burrow makes the plays that he made. Um, you know, when Justin Jefferson did what he did. I mean, when the team did what they did, you, you're a fan. I, I don't make any bones about it. I don't think I'm the most Homer broadcast, uh, uh, college broadcaster in the country. And some people maybe think I should be a little more. I just, I just haven't ever been that way. But I cannot help but be a fan, number one, before I even step into the booth. The, the, the trick to me or that fine line is making sure you express that emotion because it's natural, just the same way anybody in the stadium is reacting, anybody that's watching or listening. I mean, if you go into a sports bar when the Tigers have a big moment, everybody in there that's invested in purple and gold, emotionally, it, it takes over. So hopefully you're able to do that, but at the same time, you gotta remember there's people that are driving, there's people that maybe have you on in the background, you still gotta tell them what happened. And I've always said my job is the who, what, when, where. Uh, Doug Morrow and Gordy Rush, they provide the why. Yeah. Um, so I think that's more of the fine line than actually trying to script something because, again, I think I would completely mess that up. <clears throat> yeah, I think what you said is right. I think as the voice of the Tigers, you're obligated to be excited when big things happen, but also at the same time, every flag thrown in the game is a stupid call against Stella Shoe, you know, or that's a, you know, when the guy clearly got one foot in bounds and you're trying to say, oh, he didn't catch that ball or whatever, you know, you got to be objective to an extent. So. Yeah, because I think that, the, that because LSU is such a national brand, I mean, it's one of the biggest in all of sports, much less college sports. I mean, you can consume our broadcast, obviously, on our great stations across the state. You can uh, process it through streaming on our mobile app. It's on, you know, satellite radio. So there's a chance that when LSU is playing and somebody's driving from, you know, Fargo, North Dakota to, to wherever, that they say, hey, LSU's playing Alabama, or LSU's playing you know, UCLA. So again, yes, I wanna, I wanna frame it through the lens of LSU because again, as I've said a thousand times, I, I get to know these coaches. And in some respects, travel with the team, get to know the players. So I get excited when good things happen. And I also bemoan things when, when it doesn't go the Tigers way. But there's another audience that I have to keep in mind that they just wanna know what's happening in the game. And to me, that's probably the first job of anybody, whether you're doing TV or radio, whether you're doing a national or whether you're doing it for the team. I think the, the number one job is telling them, you know, as Joe Friday said, just the facts. And the technology, too, of how quickly this stuff is now recycled. Like me growing up, I'd watch the CBS game and listen to the radio. And then Vern at the end of the game would say, well, here's Jim Hawthorne. And they play like <laughs> one radio call that he did and pair it up with the video. Yeah. These days, a big play could happen. Uh, five minutes later, here's the here's the video and Chris Blair's call. Yeah. Uh, when it, when I grew up, it's like, well, wait till Sunday night and inside LSU football <laughs> with Kevin Wagner and, uh, and, right. and some guys and, and, and watch it and listen to it there. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that's, again, I think added pressure to everything. You know, everybody that handles the social channels, everybody who works on the video team, everybody on our broadcast. I mean, it's, it's pretty instantaneous, um, which is exciting. You know, that's a great thing, but it, it also puts a little pressure because you got to turn it around quickly. Um, and, you know, again, I think, I, I hope that our guys, our crew does a good job of, and I've always said this, if I think uh, if, if an LSU fan turns on the radio within a minute or two, they probably can deduce from our intonation and our cadence if things are going well for the Tigers or not so well. And, and to me, as long as you're able to do that, 
while at the same time get the pertinent information out, uh, then I think you've, you know, you've done your job. LSU played 10 games last year. How many did you call in person? Uh, nine of those. We, okay. uh, we had to call the Missouri game uh, virtually, <laughs> uh, which was a challenge. You know, we did all of basketball last year, you know, on the road. We did virtually here from campus. Um, so, you know, when I first started doing it, especially that first football game, uh, that, was, that was different uh, because you're at the mercy only of what the camera so shows you. Uh, the beauty of being in the venue in any sport is there's other things going on, whether it be the sidelines or even something in the crowd um, that, that you're trying to relay that information, doing it remotely. You're just whatever the producer on that broadcast wants to show you is what you see. But as we did more of those games, and Coach Brady and I both agreed doing basketball remotely was not optimum, mm -hmm. um, you kind of learn some tricks to, to overcome that. But for me, being back in the venue, thankfully we did baseball inside the venue all season. Um, that's, that's the best way to go. And I think even with some of the television and the technology you have today, yes, you can do it. Um, you know, I think ESPN really went heavy into it. And they had already been planning for this regardless of the pandemic. They were just talking about it, I think, as a, as a cost saving uh, to send guys and gals all over the country. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people learned it's, yeah. it's just not quite the same. So hopefully that's not a trend that's you know, going to stay with us. Yeah. Um, just my opinion, I have heard people, and what you and I do is a little different, but I've heard people say, oh, I don't have to be at the game covering the game. I can get the Zoom interviews and I can watch the video. And I say that's BS. I think <laughs> to really cover a game sincerely and the best you can do it, there's something, I don't want to use a big word, osmosis, but there's something about being there and soaking this stuff in before the game, during the game, after the game, it helps you tell the story, as opposed to staring at a monitor and trying to tell the story. It's well, just well, how many times have, I know you have and I have done it, we've talked about the score was not indicative of the game. If you're watching it through a lens from somewhere else, sorry, it is. <laughs> That's all you know is the score of the game. So I agree with you. I think being in the venue, uh, you know, uh, responding or, or, or picking up on what the crowd is sensing, um, you know, I've, I've seen you do your reports, you know, uh, LSU wins by 38 points and they pull away in the third and fourth quarter. There's a way you can describe what it was like being at Tiger Stadium or wherever the, the event is being held that I don't think you can do if you're not there. Yeah. Um, that's at least my two cents. And those ESPN broadcasts and whatnot, it was clear sometimes a guy hits a ball and that thing's foul. And the announcer is still excited because he can't tell where he's at in the, in the camera angle and yeah, I mean, and whatnot. I mean, think about it. If you watch a game at home in baseball, and this was my biggest fear when we were afraid last year that maybe we'd have to do some remotely. Thank goodness the SEC and all of our member schools uh, you know, were, allowed us to travel, so I'm very thankful for that. But if you're watching at home, you've got the center field cam shooting down the back of the pitcher towards home plate. We've all seen it. When the pitch goes through and contact's made, you don't know if it's a foul ball. I mean, you're waiting for them to tell you it's a foul ball yeah. or for the camera to pan out and show you what players on the field are moving. Uh, for my job, that's tough to do because you're waiting on, you know, you got to wait till they go to that wide shot and then say, oh, it looks like the center fielder's moving or it looks like the third baseman's going for the line drive. And that's, yeah. it, it takes a little time and I don't think you can really, it, it, it totally throws off your rhythm. And I've talked to a few of the two TV guys that I know that, that did some they said it was challenging, and I thought they did an excellent job to overcome it, but uh, I think in their heart of hearts, they'd much rather be at the ballpark. Yeah, it's give and take. We don't have to pay for a plane ticket, a hotel, food, but then what are we going to sacrifice in the, uh, in, the, in the broadcast? Absolutely, and who wants to miss the travel, the hotel, and who doesn't want to be in Fayetteville or Gainesville for a couple of days? <laughs> Stark Vegas or <laughs> yeah. uh, College Station. Uh-huh. Very flat place, College Station. Huh? Yes, it is. Great tradition. Love the Gainesville's not your favorite. You brought that up several yeah. times. When yeah. I was growing up, Chris, I used to think, the University of Florida, I mean, it must be awesome to go to school there. And I'm thinking palm trees and beaches and Florida, <laughs> right? Right. Gainesville, great. The Swamp's a great venue. Awesome place to watch a game. But it is not the essence. It's not uh, South Beach. It's not Destin. No, 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 no. <laughs> Far from it. Far from it. Um, you know, there, there are some great places that we get to go. And again, I have fun with it, but I am thankful to be able to go to these places. And, and you know, the Swamp's one of them. It's one of those iconic college football stadiums. Um, and and you got to give its due respect. Same way I think that, 
you know, the, whether any sport that you go to, there's some really great venues. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, as I said, I, not having traveled for basketball last year, um, did not get to go to Missouri, as I said, for football. Which I enjoyed is, that trip. It's nice. Is, that's a great place to go. And, yeah. and LSU had never played there in football. So right. I've been there with baseball and basketball. So, um, you know, I, I give them a hard time. But it is nice to be able to go to these places once again. One funny memory, not to bring up a bad memory, but last year you and John Brady were calling a game. I think I was at the red light right down here in Nicholson. <laughs> And uh, it froze and the, 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 the feed <laughs> froze and John Brady, who I've been doing for years, you know, kind of funny. I, I guess you may have been scrambling. Yeah. And Brady's like, we've lost the feed. Yeah. We can't see the feed. So we had Brady's tap dancing for a little bit there. So those are the, like you said, those are the things that can go wrong in a, in a scenario. Well, here's, like what, here's what the issue, not to get too far in the weeds. So we're getting the audio from the venue. And we've set it up in our studio on a delay so it matches the, the TV feed. So all we're seeing on the screen is just a silent video feed. So you can imagine the confusion of the screen stops moving. We still hear the basketballs being dribbled and sneakers squeak in and a, you know, whistles being blown. But we had no clue. Completely flying blind uh, for about three, four minutes. Which uh, at that point, it, it became just kind of the <laughs> John and Chris show. <laughs> The, uh, the Ed Ogeron radio show. Yeah. When I talk about football season, I, I say, really, the energy goes all week, right? Monday, he's got his press lunch, and we get to interview players. There's, we go to practice for a little while. There's a little uh, adrenaline in that. Uh, Tuesday, there's some more stuff. Wednesday is the coaches show. Uh, these really have become events, and especially in 2019, I think it was the last one he did. The line to get autographs went from... Uh, your spot there all the way back to the kitchen you know these two these poor people in the back are trying to wait tables and get the food out and there were fan stuff back there it was just uh it was amazing and coach o being true south louisiana and appreciating where he's from and all that even he was like i gotta go you know that's enough you know so uh so. <laughs> you know it's interesting because they sent uh from espn a, a writer i think during that 2019 season because LSU, thankfully, is really, oddly enough, one of the few schools that still has the opportunity not only to hear from the coach and talk to the coach via phone, but to see him in person. You know, Alabama and Nick Saban still do the Hey Coach uh, at a venue. Um, and, and I didn't know this, but they informed me there's a lot of schools that do it in a studio and away from the public. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, I think Especially it's... Especially when they're losing. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great that we're still able to do that. And, you know, Coach O said it on this year's first show, which I never really thought about, that, you know, because he loves where he's from and he loves the people that make up Louisiana, it's really the only time all year where he gets to interact with the public. I mean, when you think about mm -hmm. it. I mean, he's at the football building, you know, 26 hours a day. Uh, pretty much 365 days a year and you know as he said I go to the football office I go to the stadium when it's game day and then I go home so it's a chance for him to get out and and you know spend some time with the people who love him so much and you know it's the the night that the ESPN writer was there uh, I think is when they brought up the model shrimp boat uh, that was yeah. purple oh, yeah, and gold yeah. that had I think it was the Ed O or the coach O was the name yeah. of the boat and I remember he looked at me and he goes, this is a little bit different from the show I saw in Colorado. And I said, yeah, I can guarantee you this is going to be a, a little different experience than the Colorado <laughs> Buffalo head coach show. Yeah. My dad pointed out, too, attention to detail. He said he watched Coach Show. He came to one of the radio shows. He said he signed his name the same every time. Took his name, took yeah. time, the attention to detail. He didn't rush any of them. He gave everyone the same kind of signature and whatnot. And uh, you do see some funny interactions. Some people bring some things up there to sign sometimes that uh, are interesting. Yeah, I've seen a lot of different uh, and unique LSU memorabilia over the last <laughs> five years, to say the least. But I will say it is fun. You know, we get, you try not to get jaded in this business. And it's not really jaded as much as, as you're going so hard so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, the, for me, it's football and you know, we straddle football and basketball and then basketball and baseball. And, you know, sometimes you don't take the time to realize, you know, what you're actually taking part in. Yeah. And that coaches show for me is fun because you watch those people who come up and, and maybe the only time they will ever have an interaction with the head coach of their football team, LSU. And you see the, the sparkle in their eye, the smiles on their faces. And, you know, you, you have to think for a minute, this is pretty cool. 
I mean, this is, and, and you know, I try to remind myself that, probably not as much as I should, um, but that is one of the cool things. And I said it on the first show this year. It, it, people ask me a lot, you know, what's it like to, to, to do what you do? And, you know, to go out to, to TJ Ribs on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and I nearly have to park across the street because it's already packed. There's no parking spots available. Uh, and then you come in there, and people are, yeah. are, again, jammed in there, but very respectful. They're excited to be there. They want to hear their coach. They want to see their coach. Uh, that's a pretty cool deal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. You know, when you think to yourself, well, I get paid to go to sporting events and, you know, oh, I got to go to the LSU game and then the Saints game, you know, twist my arm, you know, do I have to, you know. <laughs> my I mean, wife tells me all the time, this time of year getting ready for football is probably a, not to, not to whine about it, but probably 60 to 72 hours a week. Uh, because there's a lot of things we have to prepare that we can't prepare for until the last two weeks leading up to kickoff. And I will come home at midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., whatever it is, and then the next morning I'll be like, you know, dragging. And she'll just look at me and smile and go, dream job, babe. This is a dream job. And I say, yes, you are correct, dear. <laughs> this is a dream job. And I, and I have to do that. But I wouldn't want to do anything else. Having grown up in eastern Kentucky, I can tell you it is a lot better than mining coal. So uh, yeah. I'm pretty lucky dude. Yeah. And there is something to be said, too, every year. The summertime kind of grind, August especially, kind of grinds by. But once this thing takes off, it flies by. You yeah. blink and it's October. You blink and it's, it's Thanksgiving. And then it's Christmas. And then the thing is over with. It really, once, once the train takes off, it's, it leaves the station pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, you kind of build the plane. Uh, then you get it out on the runway. And you take off. And boom it is it is running at uh, the speed of sound until you know hopefully you, you you finish up in in mid to late june with lsu baseball at least for me um but yeah it does go by fast it's hard to believe you know this is going to be the sixth football season um that i've been lucky enough to do what i do um because really it seems like yesterday i was getting here trying to put my arms and and head around you know, everything LSU to try to be up to speed by the time that 2016 season for football kicked off. Yeah. Um, and here we are uh, loading it up again and, you know, hitting the, hitting the levers and about to take off for year number six. Real quick, um, Doug Morrow. Yeah. This guy, like, when you, you use the word gentleman mm -hmm. in sports, you think Doug Morrow is a LSU football gentleman. You know, this guy played. He's been involved in the program for all these years. Uh, what's it been like to, to work with him? He, he was Jim Hawthorne's right-hand man all those years, and now you've had a chance to work with him as well. I'll tell you what is really, really satisfying to me. As, as a young person in my teens, I was around limited amounts of the voice of the University of Kentucky, K. Wood Ledford. My dad was in the business. He carried games, so we would have affiliate meetings and whatnot, and dad would take me along. And I always thought K. Wood Ledford was you know, always dressed to the nines, looked very dapper, and uh, just, just was, again, like you say, a, a gentleman. Uh, also got a chance to work with Jim Phillips at Clemson when I was older, and same deal, gentleman. Uh, uh, Bob Fulton at South Carolina, John Ward at Tennessee. So those are the people that I wanted to emulate and certainly wanted to be in a position to do what they do. And what's gratifying for me is that Doug Morrow is that type of guy. And I think he has done way more rubbing off on me than obviously I've done for him. He's certainly got more football knowledge and forgotten more than I'll ever know. Uh, but just the way as, as, as a human being, just, just to, to emulate how somebody behaves and how they are, I think Doug Morrow has been great. And so I get to kind of work with, those, with that type of hero that, that I had growing up. And that's what's been fun for me. Uh, and uh, he's got a good sense of humor too. And that, that was key because I like to, you know, we're not doing brain surgery here. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about football. So I like for it to be fun. And, you know, when I found out that Doug Morrow had a sense of humor uh, that, that was aligned with mine, it, it made it all that much better. Real quick, and Darren and I have talked about this when we're in the car listening to the Saints or LSU. Uh, our pet peeve <laughs> is when the color guy starts I'll say it and bleep it out. All over the play-by-play -play guys call. <laughs> you know, you could be calling the call. Doug would never do this. <laughs> but you could say, 
Here's Burrow, hands it off to Claude Edwards, the layer, go, 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 go. <laughs> or, you know, or it was, it was like the Saints, here's Breeze, back to throw, God dog it, and he's sacked, you know, that kind of deal, you know. <laughs> that, 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 that just drives me nuts. It's like, shut up. Like, the play-by-play guy does the play-by-play, and then when he's done, the color guy comes in, and Doug obviously knows how that works. So. Two things. One, <laughs> I imagine it probably irritates fans or listeners, I should say, more so than it does the people who are doing it. Again, it goes back to my point about there's so much going on that I, between the crowd, I, I don't even hear it. Um, you know, uh, and, and I'm the same way as a fan. I mean, you know, when I'm listening and I, and I actively listen to games all over the country all the time. And, you know, what happens is, is Sometimes there's so much noise, so much talking, you don't even hear what happens. You just hear blah, 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 yeah. like that. And that's the, the danger of it. The beauty is, I, I, if you remember the old TV commercials, uh, E.F. Hutton, I think it was E.F. Hutton, that when, when he talks... People listen. People listen. Yeah. That's kind of the approach Doug takes. Like, he doesn't have to fill every spot. He's not trying to fill every spot. And when he talks, he's got a, a lot of value in what he's saying. So I really don't, I've never had the issue because yeah. he, he, he does what he does. I do what I do. We bring Gordy in who does what he does in such a good, in a, in, in a, in a good fashion. Um, but I get it. I understand it. But I, I promise you, maybe, there may be a few out there that get upset about it. People usually will have to say, hey, so-and-so said something when you were talking. And I honestly, it I didn't know. It seems prevalent in the NFL. Like Sports Center plays these calls. And it's like. You know, he's at the 35, he's at the 30, he's going, he's going, yeah, go, go. Like the other you guy's know, shouting and stepping all over the one, The one I like the most is when uh, a play-by-play guy is saying, you know, their, their team, uh, our quarterback's going back, and he's throwing, looking for the end zone, ball's in the air, and then you hear the color guy go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and it's intercepted because you, you know he's, he's upset. But I will say this, it's, it's, it's nice to have guys that are invested in the program. And as I said earlier, I'm a college football fan, um, and I, I can't help but be wrapped up in it. And when you got guys, you know, I didn't play for LSU. In fact, I didn't play anything. My, my athletic season I came pretty both. came pretty early in life. <laughs> but um, you know, when you have those guys that have put the blood, sweat, and tears into the program, there's no way in the world I am ever going to say to them, "Hey, guys, listen. You know, I know you get really uh, you know passionate about LSU, but I need you to stay in your lane." <laughs> like that's that would be the most, yeah, you know. Ask nine thing in the world for me to do. And, and a whole other profession, but up there with you, Dan Bournet does a great job. Yes, he does. Of, you know, uh, Burrow, pass complete to 10 yards. But, and, and he's also kind of shared with me, we've got high school PA announcer, PA, you know, who are doing play-by-play. <laughs> we've, got, we've got more than high school. We've got college announcers who are screaming and cheering. And, I mean, it's sometimes, and you know what, LSU's very lucky. Um, in, in a lot of ways, obviously, but but me being close to uh, and hearing Dan Bournet at Tiger Stadium and, and Bill Frank as at, at Alec Box and, and Dan at uh, at the Maravich Center, it is so refreshing to know that those guys understand their professional role. Again, it's back to tell me what happened. You know, that's the role, and we go places sometimes, and I will literally. Nearly hug Bill Frank as in the baseball booth. I'll be like, you do not know how appreciative I am, and I'm sure Tiger fans are, that you're not out there screaming about the Tigers, you know, from the PA standpoint. And nobody loves LSU baseball more than Bill Frank is. He's the best. But, yeah, no, it's not just high school, man. You can go to some pretty high-name college venues, and you got some, you know, they're basically cheerleading. Are you saying it's that? Like, it's like the shout man. Like the PA guy, the Dan Bournet of whatever school is saying, here's the quarterback. He drops back to throw. He's looking. Uh, After the play happens, yeah, they'll go through oh, a whole soliloquy I got uh, you. of what they think happened and cheer it on. Which, again, I, you, know, you should. I, I think Dan has that great ability. to. He knows the moment when I'm going to prompt this crowd. Not that they need prompting. But, yeah. you know, when you score a 60-yard touchdown, Dan Bournet, you can hear it in his voice. But he's not. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've heard PA announcers almost belittle the other team. <laughs> I mean, come on. But, no, we're lucky. I mean, LSU fans yeah. are lucky uh, with Bill and Dan, to be sure. Once again, Bill Frank is Dan Bourne, a gentleman, the way they. Exactly. You know, exactly. Class. Do a class. Penalized, too. That's, that, that's uh, 
that's unique to, to Borne. Yes, it is. Yeah, as kids, we would leave the game penalized. Okay, may, may, may cut that one out, D. All right, a couple things. Uh, so this guy right here, he knows his, uh, his 80s hard rock. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to do this. 80s pop culture. I just a few things real quick, because Darren's a big fan of hair, hair bands. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Motley Crue versus Guns N' Roses. Who wins in that one? Motley Crue. The quick answer there. Yeah, no, I mean, no, there's no, no hesitation. Again, I'm a fan of Guns N' Roses, but, uh, you know, no, I'm going to make some people mad here, especially those younger than me. But, you know, Guns N' Roses was a a version of Motley Crue 10 years after Motley Crue, okay? Now, again, they were different in a lot of ways. Musically, they were different. I'll give them credit. Slash is a fantastic guitarist and songwriter. Um, but, I mean, without Motley Crue, there's no Guns N' Roses. So that's kind of how, that's how I Motley's that had one. a much longer career. Probably the volume of hits is much bigger. Well, they've been smart enough to realize that, yeah, I get tired of this guy, and Nicky doesn't like Tommy, and Vince is hated by everybody. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they have a good thing that put a lot of money in their pockets and the reason they're driving, you know, Ferraris. And we probably shouldn't just completely throw that away. Guns N' Roses, on the other hand, they just, you know, who, who, I don't even know who's in Guns N' Roses now <laughs> other than Axl Rose. He, he doesn't seem to get along they with They had anybody. a reunion, and it was yeah. Axl, Slash, and Duff. As soon as I found Those, out Steven Adler wasn't playing drums, then I thought, this is not a reunion. Yeah. Done with it. Guns N' Roses, they, their career really was just, you know, well, I was two giving, albums, three albums? Yeah, but, I, you know, they, they were on the tail end, and then grunge killed it all. So, you know, yeah. I can't blame Guns N' Roses for that. I, I, I've got every Guns N' Roses album. I'm, I'm a fan, but... I mean, if you're, if you're asking me about the crew of Guns N' Roses. November Rain came after Grunge, though. That was in the middle. I know. Of, they yeah. were still hanging on, but yeah. it was... It was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when it comes to uh, sugary pop hard rock, mm. Bon Jovi and Journey there. Who, uh, who wins out? Oh, I'll go with Bon Jovi. I'm, I mean, I like Journey, but it, that's a li that, to me, Journey's a little more pop. Yeah. You know, Bon Jovi could crank it up a little bit. Richie Sambora can make some noise. Yeah. Um, and plus, I just think John Bon Jovi's a good human being. You know, he's a pretty cool dude. He's the kind of guy you'd go and have a beer with. Um, I don't know if I'd want to do that with Tommy Lee. <laughs> Things might, might go sideways. <laughs> yeah, well, John, he's got a lot of money. Boy, he's got a lot of money. Yeah, John he does. Bon <laughs> he does. He is a pretty rich dude. So the, uh, the Van Halen debate. Easy for me, too. David D. Roth, 1978 to 84. Van Hagar, 85 to 95, basically. Van Hagar. Dan Hagar, Sammy. Every day and twice on Sunday, yeah. I just like Sammy Hagar. I think, he, again, like John yeah. Bon Jovi, he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, pretty down to earth for a super <laughs> rock star. Yeah. Um, and I just like that music. I mean, I liked when Sammy joined. And there's some great hits with David Lee Roth, don't get me wrong. But you won't find me digging into the, you know, late 70s, early 80s catalog like I do, like you said, from, what, 84, 85 yeah. uh, on. Uh, I'm just a bigger Sammy Hagar fan. I got a couple of Sammy Hagar's albums too, so I'm just a Sammy Hagar fan. Here's my quick take on that. If you put a poll out, typically two thirds will vote Roth mm -hmm. over Hagar. Yeah. But and there's no doubt that those first albums with Roth are amazing. They're sizzling. But the songs with Sammy hit me in the feels, and there was never really any songs with Dave that kind of did that. You know, no, the I mean bump songs. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with throwing on, you know, uh, some of that David Lee Roth stuff. Um, he's quite the character. Put on a hell of a show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm the same way. I mean, if I'm going back to, you know, music takes us back it's like a time machine. If I'm going back, uh, the memories that get me are going to be the soundtrack of, of Van Hagar, yeah. and uh, I just like their melodies. Um, I liked Alex Van Halen, you know, messing around with technology at that time um, and the drum sounds that he had as a drummer. I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, yeah. It was all great and it started with Eddie. Rest in peace, Eddie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say the, the one thing that's constant in that <laughs> is Eddie Van Halen. So, you know, I could probably sing and it would probably be a decent, decent <laughs> album as long as Eddie's playing guitar and keyboards. Good point. All right. So finally, uh, September 10th. Uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit, 30 years old, released mm. as a single by the band Nirvana. Certainly reflected on as one of the biggest songs in music history in terms of how it changed everything. Here comes the old guy in me. Get off my lawn. <laughs> like, I, 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 I was a senior in high school when that album dropped, and everybody was saying, man, there's this new thing, man. 
forget all that LA rock stuff, this new thing from Seattle and Washington. And uh, I, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was Nikki Six or who it was years ago said, I'm not interested in songs with a message, right? I just want to have a good time, right. uh, something cool to listen to. And when they got into the everything's awful and the world's d down and I'm miserable and I wear flannel and all this other stuff, I was like, no, thank you. So great for Nirvana. I know it's a great album. People love it. I, there's some songs I like. Uh, but the grunge thing was was not for me, so um, yeah. I think that's basically when my music stopped. Like everything from what what year? Ninety one. You just go ninety one and back. After ninety one, um, I don't know that you can find. Yeah, you can find a few on my on my uh, downloads, but not much. It did go from girls, 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 and uh, pour some sugar on me and fun to uh, Jeremy spoke in class today and, and black hole sun black hole sun <laughs> which again great musicians <laughs> great music it's just not my cup of tea I mean that's you know and, and the funny thing is is I think about music the same way I think about movies today are we gonna remake every movie I mean is that have we run out of ideas because I gotta be honest with you if you turn on the satellite radio and listen to like the 80s channel especially the 90s channel the music sounds the same in 2021, like there's no, to me, I don't, I don't see the difference. It's already been done. Yeah. And movies now, like nobody has any idea for new movies. We're just remaking it. Spider-Man's, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I, okay, <laughs> take some of the iconic figures like the superheroes and yeah, come up with new stories. I'm cool with that. I'm, yeah. I'm cool. I'm a big Batman guy. I'm cool with doing different trilogies of Batman. I'm good with that. But I mean, we're remaking like uh, some of the movies. What did I hear the other day they were remaking? I thought well, that doesn't need to be remade. I'm, you know, if they come out and say they're going to remake Goonies, I'm done. There's no reason to remake Goonies. <laughs> it's just let the, my kids today, nine and sixteen years old, they like Goonies. You know, from whatever year that was made, eighty four, eighty five. Um, they don't need a new one. I guess it's already been 11 years, but they re when they redid the Karate Kid, I'm like, that is one yeah, you no. should not touch. No, exactly. That's yeah, not to that me. Is, Let's come up with something else, you know. Yeah. So I kind of feel that way with music. But again, full disclosure, <laughs> old man alert coming at you. <laughs> he he's gonna. You guys can debate another day. Yeah, he's so like, he's like, I was so tired of that head. <laughs> really? I was telling him I was sitting on my couch and cut. I'm probably what three, four years old, and that Nirvana video came on. I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Wow. I'm so tired of well, now, 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 I mean, I see, now, I mean, you, the, now you're, you're going off to the fringe now. I wasn't, a huge, I wasn't a huge Warrant or Nelson guy. Don't get me wrong now. Some of it was bad, but uh, no, I had, I just, yeah, I, it's like I said. I need to tell him goodbye. I need to write. Okay. Message, uh, music with message, I'm not, you know, that's why I'm not big on the, uh, on the Woodstock deal. Like, every, you know, they just sing a song about having a good time. I don't need to hear what I need you to do You must not be today. a Bono guy then. No, so. you two can, <laughs> no. The message stuff was just heavy. Like Rage Against the Machine, stuff like that. Okay. Noise. Chris Blair. Pure noise. <laughs> Chris Blair, Voice of the Tigers. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, man, I enjoy it, man. Good to see you. Good to see you.